now, we'll introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Fernando Ramirez, who is senior specialist at the World Bank. Buenos días para todos. Buenos días, doctor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, doctor. Go ahead. Creo que el el profesor Ayala tiene que parar su su presentación para poder compartir la I think mi pantalla. Professor Ayala needs to stop sharing his screen in order for me to share mine. Gracias. Done. Okay. Me imagino que ya se está viendo. Can you see it? Sí, adelante. Ok. Vamos a ponerla en... Ok. Eh, buenos días para todos. Es, es para Good mí. Good morning, everyone. It is la oportunidad de an honor for me to con la comunidad de ingenieros, con address once more the engineering community and INIFED and the Secretary of Public Education on this topic to increase uh, resilience and decrease vulnerability in schools. Now, we have created a strategic partnership between INIFED and the World Bank in order to carry out a consulting service to support the recovery of the education infrastructure in Mexico after the 2017 earthquakes. The purpose was to gather knowledge based on evidence about the building's performance during these earthquakes. And I think that that is the essence of what I would call a recovery strategy, a resilience strategy for education infrastructure. My brief presentation will be divided into three. In the first part, I will address some of the main conclusions of the study. In the second part, I will refer to how we at the World Bank, particularly from the Safe School program at the World Bank, are addressing this topic. And in the third part, I will refer to the instruments and other alternatives that exist at the World Bank to support the Mexican government in this effort. To summarize the learnings derived from this study, I would like to quote Dr. Alcocer, I remember that we were writing the executive report and I asked Dr. Alcocer to briefly define what he thought was the most essential in this study, which took around a year. And you can see it here. It is evident that it is not enough to properly define and build schools. We must also maintain them. And this is a great lesson, constant in many countries that face similar situations to Mexico's. We can also carry out policy reform, for example, establishing the national strategy to improve the seismic performance of school buildings. We can push for the performance-based design to make these interventions financially viable and also to establish a long-term effort. This is not a short or medium term effort. We're talking about several years that require continuity. And we have also identified necessity of updating the regulatory framework to manage school infrastructure. The Engineering Institute set and listed a, a series of technical 
standards on design and construction that must be followed. The main technical challenges identified can be summarized in four point the updated knowledge and systematic knowledge on the condition and capability of existing infrastructure which might sound simple but let me tell you data management inventories to know the real condition of infrastructure is one of the main challenges that we have in these programs Data quality is very poor, and if data quality is very poor, all of the models and all of the technical tools that we have are useless because we don't have quality data that allow us to have models that produce proper results. The second point is atypical constructions I don't remember the exact percentage, but I think it was more than 30% of buildings. These atypical buildings open the door to a whole range of buildings. We have seen types that are no unknown that will demand an additional effort to evaluate them, to understand their performance and resolve their issue of their existence. We also had to, we have to have to issue a series of technical guides and manuals on intervention. And I think that INIFED has moved forward on this. And of course, we need to strengthen the technical capability of responsible teams, responsible for the management of school infrastructure. Now, five years ago, the World Bank created the Global Program for Safe Schools. And five years ago, we created this program to gather specific knowledge of all the projects supported by the World Bank in this matter and to make decision-taking more practical. In the coming slides, I am going to try to show what are the concepts that we use to address these issues. In this map, you can see these little dots which show education centers impacted in 2017 in Mexico. This is an image derived from the study that I mentioned earlier, and the colors show the degree of damage in these structures. When we see this map and think of the recovery, we always conclude that the issue with these schools is not an engineering issue in one building, because Complexity doesn't lie there. Complexity lies in the fact that we have to intervene thousands of buildings. So any decision has great scale impacts. The issue of reducing education infrastructure damages is large scale issue. Don't have proper data, proper diagnostics, and if we go and inspect each one of the schools, we find that the quality of the concrete was not proper because the de design was far from the standard because there was no budget to build correctly. So it's multidimensional and we need to address them all. We need to understand them in order to get to real solutions. And there's also, also budgetary concerns, resources are not enough. And so the infrastructure councils don't take this as a priority because we have the demand for more salary for teachers, food support for children, 
administrative costs. And so the infrastructure competes with other priorities that are also relevant for the sector. Aside from safety, school infrastructure requires improvement in many angles, accessibility, uh, health issues. In other words, safety is fundamental, but it's not enough or it's not the only thing that a school infrastructure must have. What we need to do is to intervene the structure to create proper learning environments. That is the effort at the end of the day. So we, disaster specialists, must broaden our minds and see how we can fit these issues within a wider framework to improve our infrastructure of schools. The other aspect is the construction realm. And let me be frank, in construction, in the way construction services are lended, there are many interests and not often transparent. In many countries, we have found great difficulties with all the stakeholders and any change in their processes mean tensions in decision takers. So this must be taken into account as well. And the last factor that I I would like to mention is the multiplicity of government levels involved. So four things that we have considered as key in the global program for safe schools is the use of technology and innovation for data management, two, decisions based on risk, three, optimization of engineering solutions, and four, maximization of benefits from intervention strategies for these schools. In other words, if we want to do this strategy feasible, we need efficient investment in resilience, which means maximizing the number of lives for every dollar that we invest. And I'm going to show you some examples of what we have been doing on this line. This is a project that we have been developing from since a year and a half ago. We have been developing a tool that uses AI to classify school buildings. We have a database of around 130,000 photographs of school buildings from all countries. And we have been developing this app with some partners in California, which would reduce costs and times to issue preliminary diagnostics that we need to do. This does not replace detailed inspections, but it allows us to do analysis of a big stock of school buildings, classify them by type, and move forward in the analysis. These are the tools, but behind them, we have a logic the development of concepts. We have developed policy, the Save School Global Library. And what we seek with these photographs is to identify these parameters and to classify these buildings. This is another example of the use of drones in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. We set up a pilot to survey models, digital models, uh, which was successful, but the cost was very high higher than what was financially viable over there. But 
I am certain that this cost is going to drop in very soon. We will see that this tool will be at our disposal in these cases. And of course, these are tools, these are data. And as I told you, we need to ensure that this data has quality and this data needs to inform a planning effort at a large scale. That's why we have developed this roadmap for safer schools and resilient schools. This is a step-by-step -step guide. It has eight steps, diagnostics, analysis, and planning. And you can see that in each one of these steps, we address each one of these specificities that allow us to plan at a great scale, uh, which means uh, defining an uh, investment strategy, an intervention strategy, and an implementation strategy. And this is, of course, very important for so many schools throughout uh, the world. So we found it was enormous difficulty for us to have this plan. So this is the methodology we designed. This, uh, the tools we have uh, been using, then they're part of the global uh, library. And uh, there's a very big catalog of topologies and those catalogs have been gauged or calibrated through the different countries where we are intervening. We have vulnerability curves as well. All those data, as you see on this chart, are informing about the steps for that intervention or the investment plan as well. Something else. I want to mention has to do with informed decisions based on risk, of, of course. It, it, here we have all the school centers, 200,000 school buildings, for instance. In 2015, we did a detailed study of all the school buildings in Peru. The education ministry, had a census, and we got those data from that census. So the intervention types, that's what you can see on this chart. You can see that 52% of the buildings have to be replaced. There are adobe buildings in the Andean region of Peru, 21% reinforcement. That is 63% of buildings in Peru require some type of investment. This gives you an idea of the magnitude of the problem. 200,000 buildings, 140,000 of them need to be replaced or reinforced. This seems to be a, a, a never-ending task, a titanic task. We either design viable strategies or decisions will never be made. Never will we be getting support for this type of program. This is the dilemma of uh, scale interventions. We have two extremes. One is updating, enhancing everything with all resources available so that we can take them at the highest uh, possible standard. But in this approximation, we're going to be using a lot of money and time and energy, and we're not going to be benefiting many students. The other extreme is to optimize, maximize or increase the number of students affected. And that way we're just going to be doing small enhancements on the infrastructure. This is the debate. And this is the type of dilemma within this strategy. Are we going to do the best or are we going to be doing small projects? This is exactly what the dilemma is all about. But we have to give numbers to all this. Those arguments need figures and numbers. 
so that we can show their impact, quantitative impact, in terms of the tools that decision makers are going to be using to make their decisions and uh, move uh, forward in the implementation of these proposals. My colleague Karina Shirley spoke about the his experiences in uh, moments of an earthquake, and I am talking about the dilemma of intervention. In the stock of uh, 500 schools we assessed, we have three typologies or typologies and uh, uh, two types of masonry. One is, uh, what is prefabricated concrete, precast. So what if we do small increments, we were wondering. What if we look into gains in terms of performance and cost benefit uh, comparisons? How can we do this? Are there other alternatives to increase the number of students being impacted through these investments? That's what we want to show you on this chart. These graphs, you see the highest bars are the first increments for each one of those buildings. They're the ones with the highest cost benefit performance. Now, the legal framework in our country, is it viable enough for this type of increments? However, this exercise was good for the government to start thinking on looking into its own standards. How can we have a different approach for all this? But this is also a very good example to invite the engineers community to start thinking that we do not have a black and white solution. The risk is not safe or unsafe structures. We have a palette of options, of colors, and we have to make efforts to try to imagine and agree on solutions that are more real and manageable, financially speaking, for governments. I will not go into these equations. They have already been mentioned by other speakers. These are quantitative risk indicators and other indicators, cost efficiency index, for instance. So the range, the order of the interventions has to make sure we have the highest numbers uh, of days vis-a-vis -vis lives saved. So we've established this range of priorities based on the index, the 40,000 schools in Peru. If we were able to implement this in the same order, we can say that the Peruvian government has a million dollars to intervene in this program, only a million dollars. With this million dollars, you see on the left-hand side graph, we could intervene a little bit uh, less than 5,000 schools. Some resources would be for reinforcement and other resources would be for substitution. You see on the right-hand side, this graph shows that in the gain, in terms of students benefited, we have very high gains on this. You can see that. So this is the type of thing we're talking about. This is a larger scale. Sometimes it's uh, not manageable as we might think, but when we start disaggregating in different phases, we see the gains, the benefits, and we have to monitor progress and results, of course, as well, and the benefits in the different stages of the process. Very well. This is the last part of my presentation. I don't have much time to finish my presentation. Value added. So the World Bank is offering financial support and technical assistance. This is a World Bank program 
and this would complement any Fed efforts, and this would have to do with optimizing investments and also supporting public policies on this. The World Bank is very useful in this type of project, as I've said. In Turkey, for instance, we've been there for over 10 years doing this type of program. So these programs are usually going through government and institutional changes. They have to adapt themselves to all those things. It's a technical, medium, long-term type of effort and strategy to strengthen technical capacity and in effect management and also the work of the states that are involved. It's a leverage for efforts of institutions like the National University of Mexico, UNAM, and in terms of the engineers community. And we are, of course, accessing methods and tools for the execution and accountability in all these projects. That's of the utmost importance. A program uh, with the World Bank will preparedness or preparation takes over a year. Knowing the Mexican case, particularly the existing information of the school situation, this could be done faster. You in Mexico have very good information thanks to everything you've done. You have all the required technical capacity as well. So I'm quite optimistic in terms of the time it would take to do this type of operation. In terms of technical assistance, we usually access technical assistance funds that are not non-reimbursable, but are complementary. And we also facilitate exchange with international peers. There are so many examples where we've connected experts from different countries to access this type of financing for those types of projects. Normally, we emphasize capacity development of all stakeholders. And these last bullets you see on the screen, well, they have to do with the national strategy, designing that strategy to enhance seismic behavior, developing a baseline and information systems and optimizing the different options and designing activities to strengthen capacities and also designing the right communication strategies. This is then the conclusion of my presentation. However, to conclude, let me say the following. Not all countries have the capacity Mexico has. Not all countries have the engineering level Mexico has. Not all countries have the institutional capacity Mexico has. So we know the challenges at different spheres, policy, coordination, regulation challenges everyone faces. However, if we compare Mexico with other countries, Mexico has a most advanced situation vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And I believe I'm very fortunate because I am in charge of the global program for the World Bank and I know so many contexts, but I think the Mexican context has the necessary ingredients, the pieces of the puzzle to design and implement this type of project. Only a little bit of communication, that's the only thing that's lacking and perhaps a little bit more political will to ensure the safety of boys and girls in schools. And this is of course the nature of the situation. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fernando Ramirez. Thank you so much. You're in Singapore. I think it's midnight where you're at. Thank you for your excellent presentation and for making such a big effort to be with us uh, to talk about optimizing resources that are always scarce, as we know. And we also want to thank your work, your thrive, your support with NFED. Thank you so much. We are fully convinced that this should be 
the sum and multiplicity of functions, especially with a lot of training. We shall continue discussing this very important subject matter. Thank you.